Amen. Amen. All right, tonight we're in Psalm chapter number 23, which is a very famous psalm. I want to draw your attention to verse number 5, where I draw the, uh, I, I derive the title of my sermon. Verse number 5, the Bible reads, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. And David says this, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. That's the title of the sermon this evening, My Cup runneth over. Now here in Psalm chapter number 23, it's by far the most famous psalm in the Bible and really all that David is doing is he is just explaining the goodness of God in his life. Now if you begin there in verse number 1, we're going to read down through here real quickly and then we're going to move on uh, you know, to a couple other verses I want to cross reference. But it says there in verse number 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. So what does he mean by that? He's saying I, I'm never lacking anything, right? He says the Lord is my shepherd, and because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I don't need anything. I'm never lacking anything. He maketh me to lie down, notice this, in green pastures. What does he mean by green pastures? He's saying these are flourishing, these are healthy uh, 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 pastures. Excuse me. This is a fruitful area, right? He's being blessed. That's what he's referring to. And then it says this, he leadeth me beside the still waters. And that refers to having peace in your life that's given from the Lord. Verse 3, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Then he says this, going further in verse 4, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. So he talks about first the goodness of God in his life. He talks about God giving him peace. He speaks of being a shepherd. And what does he do? He takes him to green pastures, saying he has food there, himself being as a sheep. And the Lord being his shepherd, he has food there. He takes him to green pastures and gives him his sustenance. He gives him what he needs. And he brings peace in his life. But then he says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Saying, yes, yeah, sometimes I am put through trials. And even when I am, that's his point. Then he says this, I will fear no evil. So even when everything's not a green pasture, everything's not a still water, right, in his life, he says, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff they comfort me. So even in trials, even in tribulations, God is still there to comfort him. God is still there to give him peace. It says in verse 5, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. So again, he's saying, even when he's in the presence of his enemies, even when there's encroaching harm or encroaching damage that could possibly take place in his life, he still has a table prepared for him. He still has what? what he needs, right? God is still providing for him. He's still preparing things for him, even when he's in a time of trouble. He says, Thou anointest my head with oil. Now, oftentimes, the Bible, your head being anointed with oil or, or this, uh, uh, speaking about oil and things like that, it's normally referring to something along the lines of a luxury, going above and beyond, God giving you more than what you need, like milk, honey, butter, those types of things. That's, that's extra, right? And he makes this statement afterwards, which is coupled that with that. He says, my cup runneth over. My cup runneth over. So what's going on here is he's talking about the goodness, or he's talking about the blessings that are given to him from God in his life. And then he makes that statement, which may have went over your head beforehand, but what's going on there is he says, my cup runneth over. His cup is representing the blessings of God in his life. And he says, my cup runneth over, meaning, meaning the blessings that God has given him or bestowed upon him or filled his cup up with, it's more than he can even handle. He's given more than he needs even. And that's the title of the sermon this evening, My Cup Runneth Over. I'm going to talk about the great blessings that we receive in our lives from God. The abundance of blessings that God gives to us in our lives. The objective of, of the sermon this evening is for you to walk out of here being more grateful for what you had when you walked in. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter number 32. Genesis chapter number 32. Genesis chapter number 32, I want to make sure that we have the right presupposition before beginning the sermon, or we have the right understanding or attitude before beginning the sermon, because what do we deserve? Before you talk about what you have, what do you deserve? You deserve to go to hell. You don't deserve any blessings. You don't deserve any goodness because you're not good. I'm not good. We're not good, right? 
We're all sinners, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none good, no, not one, right? There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth, sinneth not. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. You don't deserve goodness as a wage. You d because you've done something bad, you deserve something bad. You deserve a just punishment, which is obviously going to hell. That's what you deserve. So we need to understand, what do we deserve in the first place? What should we be given, right? And this will give us a humble attitude, and it will cause you to be grateful for the things that you have in the first place. <clears throat> I want you to look with me at Genesis chapter number 32, verse number 10. Of course, we went through this in the book of Genesis. Jacob, when he's returning back from being with Laban, coming back to the land of Canaan, he, he makes this statement, verse number 10, he says, I am not worthy, and then he says this, of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. Now notice what he says. He says, I'm not worthy of the least, of the least of all the mercies. Now what is mercy? Mercy is something that you're given that you don't deserve in the first place. And he's saying that I have, I've, I've been given great mercies from God, but he understands I'm not only not worthy of the great mercies and of the great things that you've done for me in my life, I'm not worthy of the least of those mercies. And really one of the least of the mercies that we're given, you know, I, you know, when you think of it in the grand scheme of things, it seems like the greatest of the mercies, right, is being saved from hell, isn't it? Uh, you know, it, it depends on the way that you look at it because then you have the bonuses that are put on top of that. So that's our starting point. We don't deserve, you know, you, you know obviously you can't earn mercy. That you don't understand mercy if you think that you can earn mercy, right? You can't, you can't you know, earn our salvation. We're saved by grace through faith, right? It's you know, not of our goodness. What we deserve is we deserve to go to hell. We do not deserve any sort of goodness from God. But you know what He does? He gives it to us anyways. He saved us, and not only that, He blesses us in our lives. So I want to go through some things in our life that we have as blessings, oftentimes that we look over. First, I want to begin with uh, things that are fundamental to us. Things that are very fundamental in our, in our lives that most people would at least say, hey, you know, uh, a lot of people, if you were to ask them outside of, you know, a biblical mindset or a biblical or any sort of theology, they would say, yeah, well, those are things that you should have, right? And the Bible even talks about, go to 1 Timothy 6. The Bible talks about, you know, uh, that we should be content with having food and raiment, right? So one thing, the, one of the very first things is just life in general. That's the very first thing that I want to put into your mind. Just, just the fact that you can breathe air. Just the fact that you exist in the first place, that you can think thoughts, that you can even, that you even have the opportunity to experience life. That's something that we take for granted. The fact that we are even here and breathing and moving. Not only just having life to begin with, because you don't, you don't deserve life. You don't even deserve life. You know, there's nothing you could have done before you were born to earn life, right? God created you before you ever did anything for Him, right? So just life in general, but not only that, think about all the great, think about the faculties that we have. The faculties as far as, you know, uh, the senses, that's what that means. You know, your, your, uh, the, your ability to be able to move, your capabilities, that's what faculty means in that sense. Think about all, your, you, I would almost guarantee that everybody in here has all five senses. Everyone has all of their limbs and all of their appendages, right? Well, there's a lot of people in the world today that don't even have that, right? So Keep in mind all the things that you were born with, right? Number one, life. All the faculties that you, that you have. All of the senses that you have. The capabilities that you have. Furthermore, there, I want you to look with me in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. We're going to look at verse number 8. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Look, at, look with me there at the end of the chapter. Verse number 8. It's about covetousness. I know Brother Elliot preached a good sermon about being content and, and covetousness and things like that recently. Look at verse number 8. <clears throat> Well, look at verse 7 first. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Then it says this, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. So the Bible teaches that we, as Christians, should be, with, should be content with only having the necessary food and raiment in our lives. So if, we even, if I even just grant to you just the fundamental, just the organic properties of life. Just life itself, all of your senses, right? You know, all of your faculties and the ability of movement and all of that, right? I'll grant that to you. And then on top of that, I'll even give you 
food and raiment. With that, the Bible says, let us be content. So even with having that, you should be content. Okay? So that's our starting point. Okay? Now, if we start to move forward from there, you'll start to notice, really, your cup runs over. You'll start to notice, really, that you have in your life an abundance of blessings. And hopefully this will bring about the, the attitude that Jacob had. That we're not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. So, that's food and raiment. You know what that's not including? Is that's not even including shelter. That's not even including having a place to go and to lay your head down at night. So I looked up some, some statistics actually just in America right now. And uh, if you look up online, it looks like there are around 554,000 people on average. Uh, you know, on, on, on any given night is the way that it's worded. On any given night that do not have a home in 2017 is when this was taken in the United States of America. So 554,000. You, know you know another way you could say that? That's basically a half a million. Pretty much a half a million people in the United States of America in 2017, and I doubt that that number is going down, it's probably somewhat around that, you know, still today, just two years later. There are a half a million people, people when the sun goes down at night, that have no home to go to, that have no house that they can enter into. So, you think, oh, everybody's got a home. Half a million people in the United States don't have a home to go to. A half a million people. So, Put yourself in their shoes. You know, sometimes it's caused by, by, a lot of times it's caused by personal decisions and their own mistakes, but not in every single case. There are some of those half a million that are out there because they, you know, they were just hit by life in a crazy way. Some of them are. So imagine that, not having a home to go to tonight. Doesn't that make you a little bit more grateful for what you have? And you'll start to really understand my cup runneth over. Now, you say, oh, everybody's got a home. Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 20. And Jesus saith unto him, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So, there was a time when Jesus was going around in his ministry that when it was time to go to sleep at night, he wasn't sure which house he was going to go to. He didn't necessarily have a house to go to. When he's traveling out and on his ministry and everything, he said he hath not where. Nowhere, he's saying. He hath not where to lay his head. He didn't know where he was going to be sleeping at that time. Hebrews chapter number 11, verse number 37, speaking of the great men of faith from the past, it says this, They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Then it says this in verse 38, <clears throat> of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. So notice where it says they wander. What does it mean wander? It's talking about not having a, a real a place to lodge. Not having a real place to call your home. They're being persecuted. They're on the run. And what are they doing? They're wandering about in deserts, in mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. There were many great Christians of the Old Testament who went and slept in caves for a period of time because they didn't have a home. Notice it says that they went around in sheep's clothing, right? In sheepskins and goatskins. Not even having proper clothing is what it's, it's, what it's referring to. We in America today, we have no real trials and tribulations. We have no idea what it's like to go through any real serious trials and tribulations. And because of, because of that, we have become much more, you know, uh, uh, ungrateful in the things that we have. A lot of things we just, people think, oh, that's a necessity. You know, a car is a necessity. All these things. No, they're not. These things are not necessity. Even basic shelter is not a necessity. Do you know what it is a necessity? Food and raiment. Those things are a necessity. Water, right? You can put food in that category. Things that you require nutrition from. Food and raiment. That is a necessity. Anything else, technically, you know what that means? Your cup runs over. And I guarantee your home, you have air conditioning, don't you? Amen. You know, you, you look at, these people were living in dens and caves. You know, I guess you could make the argument that it's an ambient temperature in a cave, but hey, I, I'm sure that there are times, there are parts of caves that are hot. I mean, here's the thing. 
even still the people that had homes, the house that Jesus went in and slept in, I'm sure at nighttime was hot. Look at how you are treated today in the United States of America. What do you do? You set it on what? Like 74, 75, 76? Is that about what you sleep with? What do you, what do you, what do you think the temperature of an average house in the 30s or 20s was? You know, let's say, let's say 1850. What do you think the temperature of a house at night was at? My dad, when he was growing up, you know, social services would be called for sure on him. He had ten brothers and sisters in like a three-bedroom house, and all the boys were around the same age. They slept upstairs. There was two bedrooms, and my dad sat at night. They literally had the doors open. This is on the second floor, and he said like up to like his chest, he would just lay out the window because it was so hot in the house. He would just have his head just like laying with his arms, literally, and would be sleeping like that in the middle of the night. You know why? Because he wanted some cool air. And they didn't have air conditioning in the house. Right? We take for granted so many things. You know? And, and you look at, there's a lot of people even maybe you experience. I, when I grew up in my life, we didn't have air conditioning either. We didn't, I grew up and I had zero air conditioning. Zero air conditioning until I was like 17, 18 and I moved in with Jessica. You know, at that time, that's when I experienced... You know, air conditioning, obviously I, they had it at school and things like that, but every day of my life, right? You know, these things, people look and they're like, oh, this is a necessity. Your cup runs over, my friend. What's going on is you're giving, you're, you, are ta you are, you know, becoming ungrateful for the blessings that you have today and you don't really realize it. You don't really understand that having food and raiment really is what you should be, is what you should have and that should, or, or what you could have that would make you content. You should be content with just food and raiment. And we have so much more than that. Not only that, I want you to go with me, to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 12. Deuteronomy chapter number 12. Not only, you know, uh, uh, so the, it tells us there, let me say this first. It tells us there, having food and raiment, we should be content, right? Well, <clears throat> just food just to keep you alive, right? Just any food just to keep you alive, you should be content with that. With just any food that would, that would keep you alive. But when you look at the foods that we have today, this is not the food that the majority had access to. You know, uh, you look at Paul's writing to Timothy, right? And he's telling him, hey, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Do you think he's talking about a steak dinner? You think he's talking about, hey, you know, he's like, no, I'm not content unless I have, you know, baked potato and steak. And, you know, I need a salad beforehand and I need some, you know, some vegetables on the side. Is that what he's referring to? No, he's just saying food. You know what he's saying? Nutrition to keep you alive. Having the food to keep you alive for the purpose of keeping you alive. That's what he's referring to. But if you look at the food that we have today, you know, uh, we are given, the food that we have today is a great luxury, what we have access to. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, verse number 13 says this, and also that every man should eat and drink, and then it says this, and enjoy the good of his labor, it is the gift of of God. So you can refer to eating and drinking it as a gift from God, right? And here, you're in Deuteronomy chapter number 12, verse number 15. Here in the United States of America, we have access <clears throat> to foods that people in the past could have never had access to. You could right now, when you go home tonight, let's say you just left here, went straight home, you could pick up your phone and you could literally order any type of foreign cuisine that you, your heart desired, and they would bring it to your doorstep. Do you think that Timothy could have just said, I'm in the mood for Chinese, Paul? No, it didn't work like that, did it? You know, I want some whatever it is. I want some Mexican. Now, it wasn't around at that time, but, you know, anything, you know, we, you could call, you know, you could look up in, in, in the phone book, or I guess people don't use phone books today either, but you could look up on your phone any foreign cuisine that you wanted. I mean, there's, there's nothing that's limited to you, you know? Brother Anthony uh, went out to eat, well, our families went out to eat the other night, and they had this exotic section on the menu, and I mean, they were literally selling what, like iguana, camel, you know, uh, 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 bison by extension. I mean, they were selling anything you could imagine on this thing. Anything. They were selling, like, I don't even think you can kill a kangaroo. I don't even know if that's legal. But they were selling kangaroo on the menu. You could get anything that you want. Do you think people like that had that luxury in the past? Not a chance. Do you, want, you know what food they had access to? Normally, whatever they had in their backyard that they were farming, that they were, that they were raising up. 
lamb, whatever it may be. And a lot of times they didn't eat meat all the time. They wouldn't be able to eat meat all the time. I want you to look here at Deuteronomy chapter number 12, verse number 15. Deuteronomy chapter number 12, verse number 15. It tells you this, Notwithstanding thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates. And then it says this, Whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. The unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as of the roebuck and as of the heart. That is a perfect explanation of what we in the United States of America today as modern Christians have, Christians have access to. Now this was re referring to specifically those that were traveling for the Passover at that time. But I'm, I'm thankful, let me say this as well, I'm thankful that I live in the New Testament. Because now I'm able to eat bacon, right? There's a lot of good things about the New Testament. But that is a true blessing about living in the New Testament. That just like it says here, I can eat whatever I want, unclean and clean. That was a blessing that was given to Peter when Peter was told that. Today we can eat anything we want. And we, just as this says here, we can eat anything that our soul lusts after. Think about that. You can... Food, over and over again in the Bible, is talked about as being a gift from God. Food is a great blessing. It really is. Food is a, I enjoy to eat. No, I'm sure you do as well. I'm sure you enjoy to eat a good meal. That is a blessing from God. It tastes good for a reason. God made it taste good for your taste buds so that you would enjoy it. You know what? You need to be thankful for that. We have access to more food than anyone in history has ever had access to. You know, we in the United States of America, even, even today, not only that, there are so many people that live in so many other countries that don't have the, they're just, they're, they're a century behind where we are pretty much. They don't have near the blessings that we have today in the United States of America. This is something you just take for granted. Hey, if I want Chinese, I'm just going to get Chinese. Hey, if I want Mediterranean, I'm just going to get Mediterranean. If I feel like Italian, I'm just going to go get Italian. Our cup runs over. You have more. We have an abundance. We have so much more than you can even handle. More than you could, eat, you could ever even you know, consume. I want, you to, uh, I want you to turn with me now to Psalm chapter number 128. I'm going to give you something else that, that we oftentimes become ungrateful of. Here's a good picture of us having more than what we need, more food than what we need. Matthew chapter number 14 verse number 17 <clears throat> says this, And they say unto him, We hear... We have here but five loaves and two fishes. He said, Bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fishes. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and brake and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled. Right? That's the cup being filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained twelve baskets full. What is that? Their cup runned over. That's what God does that so often. He'll give you more than you can even handle. He gives us blessings in abundance, just as Jesus did there. How often do you eat and not finish your food? Super often, right? You have more than you can even take in because your cup runs over. Psalm chapter number 128, another thing that we, we take for granted is our children, is the blessing of having children. Psalm chapter number 128 <clears throat> It's a short chapter. We'll just read the entire chapter here. Psalm chapter number 128. Let me get there myself. The Bible says, Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So it's talking about blessings, right? You're going to be happy. Verse 3, Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children like olive plants. And notice what he says right here round about thy table. Saying they're all around your table. Round about thy table. And then he goes on, Behold, uh, that thus shall the man, man be blessed that feareth the, God, feareth the Lord. So in this way, the man that fears the Lord will be blessed. In what way? Saying that you'll have children like olive plants round about your table. You know, many times people take for granted children. This is something very easily, especially with the, the, the negative influences that are being put forth from the modern philosophy of, you know, Western, which is the really new found modern uh, Western philosophy of children being like a curse. That's uh, what's put forth about children. They're basically, instead of children being considered a blessing today, they're being considered a curse today. They're, you know, people are always being discouraged from having children. You know, you need to first go to college, you need to first go go do all of these things. You shouldn't be having kids yet. 
You should, you know, you should, you know, you should go seek your own, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, career and things like that. The Bible teaches that having children is a blessing. And the Bible talks about having them round about your table is a blessing. Our children is something we can take for granted. You know, our children is something that we have them there with us every day, right? But it's something that you can forget how important they really are. I mean, obviously everyone's familiar with what's going on in my life. Can you imagine someone taking your children away? Can you imagine if that actually happened? You know how much more important that you would understand your children are to you at that point? You would understand that you were being very ungrateful with your family. If you woke up tomorrow or if in the middle of the night, you know, somebody knocks on your door, came in there and took your children away, you have no idea where they went. Can you imagine that taking place? You know, you don't realize how blessed that you really are, just your children in general, just to have your kids. If one of them, if you woke up tomorrow morning and one, one of them wasn't breathing, do you know how, you know how you know, uh, uh, sad that you would be? Do you know how devastated? Sad is a very light word. You would be devastated, right? You would be hysterical. Do you know why you would be so upset? Because, because inwardly you really know what a great blessing your children are, right? Children are, children are discussed as being one of the greatest blessings that are repeated all throughout the Bible. It's, it's talking about a man that's happy here. It's talking about a man that's blessed here. What does it say? It says that they'll be like olive plants all around you, your table. What's another point that you can derive from that? Having a lot of children is a blessing. Having a lot of children is a blessing. Look at Psalm chapter number 127. We'll see the same thing here. Psalm chapter number 127. We won't read the whole chapter like we did last time. Look at verse 3. It says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Then it says this, As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. So it talks about arrows in the hand. Not singular an arrow. It talks about arrows... In the, in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. And then it says in verse 5, notice again the word happy. Notice that keeps coming up. Blessed, happy. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Notice the man that's happy. Who is it? It's the man that has his quiver full of them. His quiver is stuffed full of them, right? You know, there are many women that are not able to have children in the first place. You, know, you see Hannah when she's crying in 1 Samuel chapter number 1. You see how devastated she is. You know, she's to the point of depression where you know, Samuel thinks you know, she's losing her mind and everything. You know, she's, she's, she's dying for children. She would do anything for children. She's not even interested in her husband at this point. She's just, all she can think about is that she just wants to have a child. We need not to take our children for granted. You know, truly, you know, having many children is a great blessing. <clears throat> the more you have, the more blessed you are. A lot of terrible things happen to people's children when they're young and things like that. Don't take your children for a granted. You know, you, what you should look at your life and you should understand, really, your cup runs over. You have so many things that God doesn't have to give to you. You have so, mu so much more then you really, you don't deserve anything. You have so much more than you can even, you can even do anything with, right? We're just blessed by abundance. I want you to go with me now. We're going to read a couple of these about the, the blessings of children. Go with me now to Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 22. I'm going to read you from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. I want you to think about this same concept. It's taught over and over in different ways of our cup running over, being given more than we can even, we can even consume. More, God provides more than we need. Ephesians 3.17 that, that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ and then it says this which passeth knowledge which passeth knowledge that ye, may be, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Notice that. He does more than we ask or think. That's what it means your cup runs over. You, the things that you pray for and that you ask for for God, God gives you even more than that if you were to really look around in your life. You have far more than you even need from God. You're in Genesis chapter number 1. Again, I want you to see the blessing of children. The very first time that, 
The, the subject is talked about, someone having children. I want you to notice what it says in Genesis 1, 22. It says this, And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful. I'm sorry, let's talk about the fowls of the air. Skip down. Look at uh, verse 28. Point still proven, all right? They were blessed to be able to bring forth and, 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 uh, and multiply. Verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. So I want you to notice here when God tells them to have children, He tells them to be fruitful and multiply. What does it say that God did for them or to them? It said God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Being able to have children is a blessing from God. I want you to turn now to Psalm chapter number 133. Psalm chapter number 133. Psalm chapter, Psalm chapter number 133. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about now the, the blessing of fellowship with other brethren. The great blessing that we have with fellowshipping with our brethren. Psalm chapter number 133. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And he goes on, It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, as the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. And then he says this, For there the Lord commanded the blessing. So notice, he's saying that this is a blessing. The blessing, even life forevermore. <clears throat> the blessings of fellowship that we are able to have as Christians, oftentimes you take this for granted. There are so many Christians in other foreign countries that aren't even able to openly be a Christian. I know there's all sorts of persecution I've heard about that's going on in China right now where even they're, they're going in and busting down underground churches. You know, you don't know what's true and what's not true, but these things do happen. There are places on the earth today, in countries today, where people are not allowed to openly be a Christian. So you know what that means? They're not allowed to openly go around fellowshipping with other Christians and talking about you know, uh, uh, the Bible and things like that. We take for granted the fellowship that we have at our church here. Not only that, the great unity that we have around Bible doctrine. You know, the, the great unity that we even have around Bible doctrine. You know, there's nothing better than being able to sit down with a brother or a sister in Christ. I'm sure the women feel the exact same way. And have a wholesome, clean, pure conversation about something spiritual. About God's Word. You take these things for granted. Think about, you know, probably, you, you probably were at a place one time where you were, you know, living somewhere where you felt like you were kind of disconnected from that. Before you, you know, packed up and moved maybe to Arizona or moved here or wherever it may be. But think about when you were there, you know, uh, in your church and... <clears throat> You were thirsting for fellowship. You were thirsting for just a brother that you could sit down that was like-minded with you to talk the Bible with. Right? You forget the great blessing of being able to sit down with someone, that another person that's zealous just like you to just talk about the Scriptures. You go to, you go to churches all the time today and people aren't even interested in talking about the Bible. They're not even interested in talking about spiritual things. They want to talk about sports. They want to talk about all these other things except for... The Bible. You take things like this for granted. There's, there, there's no greater friend, there's no greater relationship that a person can have than a relationship that's spiritual. It's far above even you know, a biological relationship you know, with a father or what, whatever with the absence of you know, the spiritual relationship as well. Maybe a family member that's, that's saved, of course, that can be just as great. But a, even a, a biological father, mother, whoever it may be that's not saved, you will have a much greater and deeper relationship with one that is saved. There's nothing greater than the relationship that two brothers or two sisters have. Two brothers in Christ. Now, you, know, you, you think of, of, of the commonality that we share. That we both serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we've both taken part in that same grace. We've both taken part in that same love. And we both have an understanding of what... The creator of the universe, of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us. I mean, there is no greater relationship. It doesn't matter where you find this. You know, you can have a good relationship or you can try to find some good relationship outside. I'm saying, you know, some, some person maybe that's not saved. They may think that they have a good relationship with somebody at work. They may think that they have some good relationship with maybe some guy that 
you know, plays on a sports team or whatever it may be, goes and gets a, a part of some club or some lady gets in some club and she, you know, she may think, oh, I have some really good friends here. It's nothing compared to the, the, the relationships and the friendships you can have with born again believers. It's nothing. Then the sincerity, you know, oftentimes those people will stab you in the back before you know it. Oftentimes, you know, the people in the world, they're only interested with, in you when you are giving them some sort of advantage in life in some way. When they're actually getting something from you. Oftentimes that's the truth, right? You know, the, the, the relationships that you have with your brothers and sisters in Christ, it's so easy to take, take that for granted. But there's nothing like it. There's nothing like, you know, a brother and a sister that you know that you're having trouble, you're going through a hard time, you know that you can call them and they'll help you. You know that you can call them and say, hey, I'm stranded, I need something, and you know for a fact, you have no doubt, I know that that person will show up. There's nothing greater than that. There's nothing greater than the relationship between brethren or the relationship between a brother or, or you know, uh, uh, sisters in Christ. There's nothing in comparison to that. Not only that, we can, by extension, you know, we can take for granted our church. We can take for granted the great church that we have here. The fact that we have unity around sound Bible doctrine. There are so many churches that don't have that. Churches that are... You know, the fact that we preach doctrine here. You know, I remember when I was just a young Christian, I was just like thirsting after God's Word. I wanted to learn God's Word. And what I wanted was I wanted a church that's just teaching the Bible. That's what I, I was dying for. I wanted to be taught more than anything. I wanted to actually learn. You know, sometimes we can take for granted the style churches that we came from, the style church that this is, a teaching church. A church that is very and sincerely interested in the truth. You can take for granted a church that stands for the truth. This church will stand for the truth no matter what. You know, even if, let's say, you know, somebody gets a hold of a sodomite sermon, you know, it doesn't matter who shows up in that parking lot. We're all going to show, I trust that all of you will. I mean, we're all going to show up here. I'm for sure going to be here. I'm going to be behind this pulpit. I'm going to be preaching. I don't care if these bunch of freaks are standing on this sidewalk right here. I'm showing up and I'm preaching. And you know what? Most churches wouldn't do that. Most churches would not have a pastor that has a background that would show up or even congregants that would show up. You know what you do? You Sometimes it's easy to take for granted what we have here. Think about what we had to do and how much we had to fight for this church and what we had to do. You forget about how sweet the first service was. You forget about everything that we had to go through for this church. And you can start to take these things for granted. You know what you really understand when you stop and you dwell upon this? Man, my cup runs over. I have more than I could ever imagine. I have an abundance. I have more than I could ever ask for, even more than I asked for, right? It's so easy to forget where you came from to forget what you had. You know what happens is you start to become complacent. You start to get to a place in your life where you're complacent and you're like, oh, these are just things that I deserve. You're not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which God has showed unto you as servant. You're not worthy of it. You're not worthy of the least of the mercies. But you know what? God didn't stop there. He multiplied the fish. He multiplied the bread. And then you have left over. He filled up your cup and it's just pouring out on the sides. You have more than you could ever think or you could ever ask for. And it's so easy in modern day United States of America to just think, man, we got a hard life. Man, it's rough. You got to be kidding me. There were Christians wandering about in sheepskin and goatskins, wandering about in the deserts, going into caves and dens. Jesus said, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Look at your life, my friend. Look at the things you have access to. You're getting ready to jump into a car here in just a few minutes. And because it's a little bit warm outside, you're going to make sure you turn your AC on, right? And a lot of people, when it's cool, they'll make sure they turn on those seat warmers. Those are the things that you have access to. That is what you have. That's the life that you live. You, you have access to the greatest foods, that it, every food that you could ever imagine in all the earth. You have, there's nothing that is deprived from you today. You live like kings do in some third world countries today. That's, right. That's the life that you live. And you're, you know, you forget about this. Do you know what's going on in your life? Your cup runs over. Amen. You're given way more than you could ever ask. Way more than you could ever even use. God multiplies more and it's just left over. That's the life that you have. And...
That's the life that we have here as Christians today in the United States of America. Uh, the very last point that I want to hit on, I want you to turn to Proverbs. <clears throat> the book of Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter number 18, verse number 22. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter number 18. One thing that we take for granted oftentimes is our spouse. We can take for granted our spouse. Proverbs chapter number 18, verse number 22 says this, Whoso findeth a wife, <clears throat> findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Sometimes you can take for granted your spouse, right? You know, but here's the thing. It is difficult. It is hard today in the United States of America to find a good, godly wife. Do not take for granted your wife. And the same thing goes for the women. Do not take for granted your husband. It is difficult. And, you know, we live in a filthy society where it's degrading quick. There's degradation just everywhere you look around. Everything's you know, degrading. Everything is, right? Do not take for granted the fact that you have a good, godly wife. You know, one thing that I love, I just thought of this, one thing that I love in the Bible, <clears throat> I don't know if you've noticed this before. Go, we'll look at it real quick. Go to Song of Solomon. Go to the very end of Song of Solomon. <clears throat> I guess it popped in my mind because we're here at the end of Proverbs. <clears throat> Go to Song of Solomon, and I want you to go to the very last chapter, chapter 8. <clears throat> we'll, we'll look at this, and then we'll go to the New Testament, where this is actually brought up again. I'll show you something real interesting. So, right here in uh, Song of Solomon, it says in, in verse 1, it says, Oh, that thou wert as my brother, that sucked the breasts of my mother. When I should find thee without, I would kiss thee. Yea, I should not be despised. It said, verse 2, I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house. Who would instruct me? I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. This is not exactly what I was looking for. Somebody real quick, search on your phone. In the book of Song of Solomon, look for the word sister. I'm going to go. I want you to turn, everybody else, turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. <clears throat> I think I know what one of them is, but I'm not sure. What is it? Chapter 5, verse 1 is one of them. Do <clears throat> you know where the other one is? <clears throat> it's like popcorn preaching. So 1 Corinthians 9, and then yeah, the other one is chapter 5. Get Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 1, and then do you know the other one? Oh, it's verse 2, so it's verse chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, and I think there was one other one too, but this is okay, we'll just use this. I, I got it confused with that one, chapter 8, that's not specifically the one that I wanted where it talks about the thou word as my brother. Look at chapter 5, verse 1, I want you to notice what it says right here. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. Now, of course, this is Song of Solomon speaking, and he says, my sister, my spouse. So he refers to her as his sister. He says, my sister, and then he says, my spouse. So who is this? This is his wife. But what does he call her? He says, my sister, my spouse, right? Look at verse 2. I sleep, but my heart, my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew, and my locks with the drops of the night. When you look there at Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 1, you can see that it's not really his physical sister, is it? You know, because she makes a statement like, I would that you were, you know, my brother that sucked the breasts of our... So he's not his physical, biological sister. So what is it? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter... I think it's chapter 9. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. I want you to look at verse number 5. It says this, Have we not power to lead about... Watch this. A sister, a wife as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas. So notice what he said. Have we not power to lead about a sister? And then he says, a wife. So what is it referring to? It's referring to a sister in Christ. You compare Song of Solomon, you compare 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. You're actually in 2 Corinthians 6 is where you're given the commandment, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Right? We take for granted the fact that our spouse is also our sister in Christ. That's why it says, My sister, my spouse. Have I, don't I have power to lead about a sister and a wife? What's he talking about? He's talking about another fellow Christian. He's talking about a sister in Christ. Doesn't he have power to lead about 
then he says a sister and a wife. You know, some people I've heard have said, well, it's because it's you know, they're all of Israel. Well, that's not the case here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. We're in the New Testament where Paul is clear, none of that matters. Obviously, they even inter intermarried even in the Old Testament. I don't believe that. I believe that it's referring to the fact that they're both Christians. They're both sis it would be his sister, and he would be her brother because they both have the same father. The Lord Jesus Christ. Deal with it. No, I'm just kidding. They both have the, the same father, right? Really. Jesus. God. The one and only true God. They share a common father. You know, this is something that you, that you take for granted. Sometimes people get married. One gets saved and the other's not. Be thankful that your spouse, spouse is a sister. Amen. Be thankful that your wife is a born-again believer. That she's a godly wife. Be thankful for all the goodness that you have in your life from the relationship with your wife. Amen. All the things that your wife does for you, and I've said this before, Matt, if you woke up tomorrow and your wife was debilitated and she couldn't get out of bed, you'd be thanking her a lot. You'd be a lot more grateful for her you know, after all that was done, once she's out of bed and everything, than you were before. Right? You'd realize how much she really goes through. And... You know, anybody who's around me knows, like, I lose my mind when all the kids are just going crazy. I do not, and I know I think most men are like that, but I do not have the patience for that. Women and men are just wired differently, I think. Is it all the men like that, too? Yeah. I just start going crazy, man, when they're just running around. I can't handle it. I'm sure Mrs. Bops heard me screaming at the kids earlier. You know, I'm grateful for my wife. She just sits there while the kids are just, like, yelling in her face. It's like, how do you put up with that? We're just wired differently. I'm thankful for my wife and that she, you know, does that kind of stuff for me that I, I couldn't deal with, right? It drives me crazy. But, you know, God gave, you know, the wife to be a help meet for us, right? That doesn't mean help mate. That means help meet, like a help fit. You know, it's like your other rib, like I've said before as well, right? It's the part that you're missing, right? It's, it's, it's what completes the relationship, it balances out the personalities. Men and women are not the same. We're not the same at all. Be thankful that she's around to do those things that you can't do and don't want to do. And then she's the same way. Be thankful that he's around to do those things that you can't do and, and don't want to do. Both. Don't, you know, you, you don't realize. There's so many people that don't have the opportunity to get married. Well, for whatever reason. Or didn't get married or whatever. They don't have a godly spouse. They don't have... So they, they look for, they maybe live in a country where there's almost no one that's Christian, right? Be thankful that you have a wife. Furthermore, be thankful that you can look at her and say, my sister, my spouse. Be thankful. Understand all the blessings that you have in life. Your children. You know, sometimes you have to think those thoughts. What if they disappeared today? It would make you more grateful for them, wouldn't it? You know, stop and think about all the, everything you have access to. You know, food. You know, all these things, you know, the Bible says having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But do you know what? God didn't stop there. Your cup runs over. You have way more than that. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your blessing.